this might be a good time for us to check in and make sure that you're on track with your uh, studying so that you're going to be able to succeed in AP 120 this semester. Uh, you've already put so much work into it. it. You really don't want to have to do this a second time, do you? you? You know what? It's just better to go ahead and focus. And as much as your life will accommodate, just schedule yourself to be studying at certain times. Remember, from the very beginning, I warned you, this class was going to take a lot of your time. This ain't kindergarten. This is college. And this is a very difficult course. So most students will say that you're going to need to study about 16 hours a week to get an A. Not all of it on lab. you got to set aside time every week to be studying for the lecture exams because the material that we're studying is not stuff that you can cram for successfully, not unless you've got one of those you know, amazing kind of memories. This is stuff you've got to sit with and let it sort of permeate your brain. So um, get yourself back on track. If you haven't been using your smartphones to nag you, hey, now's the time to study. Now's the time to watch those videos. Go ahead and schedule it. Make your smartphone your friend. Also think about changes that you should make to your study habits. Um, over at the Study Skills Workshop at the Success Center, this is, this is the website, but let me just show you what it looks like. Here we go. Okay, all of these are study, study skills that um, they're recorded online workshops that you could watch. Um, uh, exploring careers, choosing a major, that could be really useful what it takes to be a successful student. They got a workshop on it. They're never gonna see your face. Go ahead, turn it on. As a matter of fact, what it takes to be a successful student, you may find you're not getting as much support from your family members that are part of your household. That would really be useful. If mom and dad aren't helping and aren't respectful of the amount of time you need to be studying, you might ask them to sit through this workshop with you, right? Um, uh, let's see, developing critical thinking skills, that can be good. Oh, how to reduce test anxiety. Oh, they should have one of those for proctorio, shouldn't they? Um, learning strategies. That would be a good word. You know what? If you spend 40 minutes or 45 minutes for one of these workshops and you just come up with one tip that saves you 10 minutes a week, it only takes you five weeks before you've more than paid back the amount of time it took you to attend the workshop. And by the way, these skills will be yours forever. Um, oops, sorry. Um, there are also live workshops that you could do um, about math. Right now they've got kind of a lot of math ones. Let's see, discovering your learning style. All of these things are things that can help you be successful, not just this semester, but you'll take them into future semesters and also into your careers. As far as my own tips, use the study guide. I tried to make that a point from the beginning, but let me make it again. I make these, these study guides, and if you were to meet with me in an office hour, I can show you that from exam one, Every single question on there is mentioned in the study guide. So print out the study guide. You may want to give it a lot of room. And before you start to watch my lectures, read what are the questions you're looking for the answers to. This is my study guide. So in the study guide, it says, oh, um, something about what's, what's an ion or what's molecular weight. Right? Then when you're listening to my lecture, and there I am going, well, molecular weight, about, and you're like, your brain is going to go, hey, that's an answer. That is actually a learning moment that you didn't have to work hard for. Uh, recopying your notes and reviewing them right after you're done, that's a good idea. Uh, working with a study group, that can be good, particularly people that are in your labs. You may be able to uh, put together a study group and explaining your knowledge. Talk to your mom, talk to your baby sister. They don't have to understand what you're saying, but say it out loud. Explain the concepts out loud. 
that is also a really important learning moment that really doesn't take much time. Well, listen to my lectures while you're folding the laundry. You, you can go ahead and download lectures or be watching them on a smartphone and just listen to them while you're doing something else. But now we're going to be talking about bones in general and the skeletal system. Yeah, bones are living tissue, not like this, although I guess Halloween's coming up before too long, uh, but the tissues are alive. The bones that we have in the lab, those bones of course are dead. They're not growing anymore. They don't have living cells anymore. Bones, remember, have got that hard matrix that gives them shape. And all of that matrix stuff is not alive. But while you are alive, there are living cells inside of your bone that are constantly changing your bone. So what do bones do? Well, the first thing that probably everyone could answer is that they interact with our muscles. And since they interact with our muscles, our muscles can attach to them and pull on them. And that allows us to make gestures like this, okay? So that's an easy one right? But they also are important for enclosing and protecting our internal organs. Uh, let's look at that. Um, one thing, do you see the strange structure of our rib cage? The human rib cage was designed to be able to protect our lungs and, and our heart while still being flexible and movable, kind of remarkable. So the skeleton, your ribs, I just said it. The ribs protect your heart, your lungs, a little bit your kidneys. Your kidneys sit down right around here. So from behind, your kidneys get a little bit of protection uh, from your ribs. What about your cranium? Your cranium, I'm hiding it up there, but your cranium is going to be protecting your brain. Oh, um, I guess your eyes also, your, your tongue. Um, and then your vertebrae. The vertebrae, these little bones that make up your backbone, uh, they protect your spinal cord. Your spinal cord, part of the central nervous system. And your pelvis, that's not pictured here, but your pelvis protects your urinary bladder a little bit and your intestines a little bit, right? So your skeleton also protects internal organs. What is the third thing that the skeleton does? It enables mineral homeostasis. Let me remind you of homeostasis. The whole human body needs to be not too much, not too little, just right. That little Goldilocks set point where things are not too warm, not too cold, just right, that describes homeostasis, right? The minerals in your bloodstream and in the tissues around your muscles and your heart, they also need to have just the right amount of calcium and phosphorus not too much, not too little, just right. However, there are many meals that you will eat in a lifetime that have almost no calcium in them. If you, for lunch, you were really pressed for time and all you had was a bag of chips or a bunch of French fries, you had a zero calcium diet. You know, every time your heart beats, every time you use your muscle to write notes, right? your body is using up calcium. Um, and if you didn't have enough calcium stored somewhere, then a low calcium meal or two could make your heart stop. That would be bad. But we don't have to worry about that because our body stores calcium and phosphorus in our bones. Before I move ahead, I want you to think about where does the body use the element phosphorus. I'll give you a hint. It is found in the molecule phosphate. Where is there phosphate in our bodies? Right, in your DNA and in your RNA, right? Because every DNA and RNA are polymers made up of monomers that are called nucleotides, and every nucleotide is made out of a phosphate, a sugar, and a base. So no phosphorus, no DNA. Now, the human body stores, stores calcium and phosphorus, don't forget phosphorus, inside of bone tissue, and we use it for every beat of our heart. Let's look at bone. Now, 
you're going to learn in lab and also later in this set of lectures that bones themselves are made out of two different kinds of bone tissue. The bone tissue that is here on the outside of bones that you would be touching if you were handling a bone in lab, that is called compact bone. But just underneath the layer of compact bone, there is bone that is designed to look like this. And that is called spongy bone or cancellous bone. There's one more word for it anyway, spongy bone. And that's because it looks like a sponge. It's supposed to look like a very dense sponge. If you have had a lifetime of not enough calcium in your diet, that can be one of the reasons why you develop the health problem, osteoporosis. And in osteoporosis, instead of your spongy bone looking like a dense sponge, your spongy bones looks like a pretty sad sponge, right? Now, osteoporosis would happen if you do not eat as much calcium or you do not store as much calcium as your body uses up in a given week. If you spend more than you're taking in, then your savings account of calcium that looks like this would start to look a little bit sad. And when your balance of calcium in your calcium reserves is getting low, you have got osteoporosis. Osteoporosis is very common in not just Americans, but in most people in industrialized nations. It is more common in women than in men, but the, the number of men that are developing osteoporosis is increasing more quickly than it is in women. So uh, it probably will never be 50-50, but the number of men that are developing osteoporosis is much greater now than it was, say, 50 years ago. And you may have noticed that your mom is not as tall as she used to be, and that your grandmother is not only not as tall, but she might also be developing a hunch. And sometimes in like the grocery store or something like, you might see an older person who is bent over very dramatically, and it always reminds us, ooh, shoulders back. The truth is, this is not just a posture problem. The truth is, even if this woman here, the 65 plus, even if she did have muscles as strong in her back as Dwayne Johnson, they still could not pull her posture back up into a normal position. And that can be because osteoporosis, when the bones get very thin, they will start to crush. So let me show you. This is the shape down here of a normal thoracic vertebra. A normal thoracic vertebra, this side points towards the front of your body or like towards your lungs. And this side points back to the back. You will learn that this area here, right here is called the spinous process. Imagine if you had spines coming out your back, uh, the spinous processes are pointing backwards. This part of each vertebra here is made primarily out of compact bone. So it maintains its integrity um, very late in the progression of osteoporosis. But this area here, this area here, you can envision as kind of like being a Coca-Cola can. It has got <coughs> compact bone around the outside, but in the center, it is filled with spongy bone or cancellous bone, or there's that third word, trabecular bone. We think spongy bone, okay? Now, when the spongy bone is dense like this, then this, this uh, Coke can will maintain its integrity. But when you've got osteoporosis and the bone there is not very uh, vigorous, then you will get these crushing fractures. And it will be this part of the soda can that will crush because this part is being supported by all of that compact bone. And that makes it so that these vertebrae that are supposed to be like soda cans are now wedge shaped. Oh, sorry. I'm like, what is going on? It was my 
I watched that was vibrating. All right. So what happens when those vertebrae become wedge shaped? When the vertebrae become wedge shaped, then you can no longer stack them on top of each other. If you try to stack a bunch of these, they'll make a nice little tower. If you stack these, they will make a curve. So when people develop osteoporosis, they can't stand up straight, even if their muscles were strong enough to pull their shoulders back because their bones won't stack that way anymore. Now you want to prevent osteoporosis because right now you are at the age where you can still make your bones stronger. You know, scientists say that once we get to be, I don't know, it's early, it's like in our late 20s. After that, you can't make your bones stronger anymore. You can only keep them from getting weaker. I hope that's not true. But what can you do? Getting enough calcium in your diet. You should get 1,200 milligrams a day. Um, if you are a meat eater, we think people who have a vegetarian or a vegan diet can survive on less calcium a day without developing osteoporosis. You need enough vitamin D. You should get a thousand international units. If you actually do get sunlight, like if you actually do go outside in the sun, it doesn't have to be for that long, but you need to be outside in the sun with your arms exposed. If you're fair skin, you can get by with as little as 20 minutes a day. The darker you skin, the more time you need in the sun. Ah, or you can just take a supplement that's got calcium and vitamin D in it, apparently. Um, you know, you would think your skin makes vitamin D, sunlight makes vitamin D. I don't need to take vitamin D. Did you know that more than half of Americans have got a vitamin D deficiency when we measure it on a blood test? Crazy, right? We spend all of our time inside because that's where the TV and the computers are. And then you need weight-bearing exercise. That's another problem with modern life. In ancient life, we'd be uh, picking up rocks to hurl on, I don't know, the animal we were trying to trap or something like that. I mean, we were carrying things and building things and walking places and doing stuff. But now what do we do? What am I doing all day? I'm sitting here inside in front of a computer, lifting my fingers to type. So weight-bearing exercise is actually necessary. And by the time we're done with this set of lectures, you will understand why weight-bearing exercise is necessary. There are living cells inside of your bones that are there to notice, am I using this bone? If I'm using this bone a lot, they send out a signal that says, hey, she's using this bone a lot please come make it stronger before something bad happens. And if I'm not using it, like I'm sitting on my tush all day, those cells will say, evidently this bone's not so important. So it can go away. So weight-bearing exercises are things like running, um, rat, you know, anything that causes you to like actually, you know, jump. Um, walking is considered weight-bearing, but running, you compress your bones more, Racket sports like tennis uh, you, or ooh, basketball, you uh, compress your bones more. Weightlifting, you compress your bones more. Okay. And then we have, we have got hematopoiesis. All right. I'm going to start at hematopoiesis at the beginning of the next video.